Okay, perfect. So I see that a few people are still joining us. Just want to quickly see how many people we have. We've got 12 right now. Um, and we're also streaming on YouTube. So there was also streaming live on YouTube. So um, there may be additional additional viewers there, it looks like. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, Danny, I'll update you if the numbers change significantly sort of throughout. Um, I think I see some familiar names. So you will have just seen us in the last, uh, or seen me at least in the last uh, hour. Um, so this is, our, this is our final K-12 session for Open House, for virtual Open House this year. And we're, I'm really excited to actually uh, end with this because this allows us to um, do something a little more interactive. Um, for those of you who are on this right now, um, we did have templates that were online um, for this particular um, session. If you don't have them, don't worry. I'm going to send a message in the um, in the chat box, um, and we'll uh, I'll send you those um, those templates. You can follow along, and what I encourage you to do is actually um, hear the presentation, see what Danny has um, to present, and then um, share those um, templates that you might finish drawing and sketching out and coloring um, once the session is done, and send that to us and, and share your work with us. So this will all make more sense in a couple of minutes. Um, so for our for our last presenter uh, for our K-12 um, sessions during open house. We have Danny Din and she works for the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. Um, which is one of the many uh, centers that are part of the Earth Institute um, and IRI where Danny works and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory share a campus in Palisades, New York. Um, and she is going to lead us in a session today titled Imagining the Future City. Uh, so if you have questions during the presentation um, for Danny, please um, use the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to share where you can download the, the template that I was just talking about um, in the chat box. So Danny, take it away. Yeah. Thanks so much, Cassie, for the introduction and for helping me navigate um, the uh, this session. So hi, I can't actually see you with my while sharing my screen. Uh, so I just want to say hello and thanks so much for joining the session. And I hope uh, we're going to have some, I guess, fun thinking um, about the future because um, throughout open house you may have heard a lot already about climate change and what is actually happening um, and what are some of like the impacts that uh, the potential impacts that will alter the way that we live our lives now um, so i should i want to maybe go over very quickly again um, so if it's a repeat i apologize if not i hope you learned something new but you may be familiar with the carbon cycle. Uh, the atmosphere, the air that is around us is comprised of a lot of different types of gases. And amongst it is carbon dioxide. And as a natural part of the atmosphere, we breathe, out, we breathe in oxygen, we release carbon dioxide. So do animals, plants will take up this uh, carbon dioxide to photosynthesize along with sunlight and then release oxygen back into the atmosphere. And then you have um, a lot of human activities or um, and when you cut down a tree, you may release more carbon dioxide into um, the atmosphere. So this is an ongoing cycle. Um, it happens naturally, but human activities certainly push this uh, cycle into overdrive. And then you have an excess amount of carbon dioxide. And why does it become a problem? How does it tie into climate change? And then what kind of impacts does it have? Well, there's like a little air blanket, if you can think of, um, around the earth. And is carbon dioxide just one part of it? But what it does is that when sunlight comes into our atmosphere, these gases help keep it warm. It will, it will warm up and this warmth is how we are able to walk outside, how we're able to, um, to grow our food, how we're able to um, you know, live and, and evolve into the society we have today and animals do the same. Um, but when you have 
an excess amount of CO2, which helps trap uh, the sunlight in a, an effect you may have heard as the greenhouse gas, uh, the greenhouse gas effects. It keeps, it makes the atmosphere warmer and warmer. And when you have this ongoing cycle that earth has been going through for millions of years, and you tip that over balance, something is probably gonna change, right? So in nine, around 1950s, um, Dr. Charles Keeling started to track the carbon dioxide emission or that is available in the atmosphere. And he does this out of a station in Hawaii. And you can see that it, while it does go up and down fluctuate um, because there might be more activities that um, release uh, carbon dioxide in the summer versus the winter, um, there's a natural fluctuation, but as you can see from this graph, it's a pretty alarming trend that it goes up and up and up and up um, to our present time. And in 2013, it actually crossed over a threshold that's never been seen before, which is now for over 400 parts per million. And so how do we know how that carbon dioxide actually is causing the earth to warm up? Well, scientists have been studying this for a long time and they continue to do that, but it's pretty clear and evident when you, when you put the carbon dioxide concentration um, and, at, look, and look at the graph of how the global temperature, and this is not one particular location, this is an average um, of land and sea temperature. So there might be like winter temperature, summer temperature, how much it deviate from what it usually is. And you can see there's a clear trend of the earth warming up, but we only know this far um, because we only started, uh, we only have the graph going back to the 1980s because that's uh, when we can estimate how much um, carbon concentration was actually in the atmosphere. But can anyone guess, um, and you can raise your hand, you can type in the Q&A box um, and tell Cassie, why did the, Earth, like you can see, like around the 19, 1800, something changed where the carbon dioxide emission started to go up. Um, is there any significant like changes in human history, um, in civilization, in the way that societies develop that may have contributed to this? So Danny, we have one answer so far, the Industrial Revolution. That's right, uh, that's exactly uh, yeah. what it Industrialization. is. Industrialization, yep. Yeah, you are right on, that's exactly it. It's, um, you know, we, we've we always, humans have existed for a long time, but up until the Industrial Revolution, we've never really put that much amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emission into the atmosphere like we do right now. And, you know, when we have climate change, it's not just the cute animals that are affected. Um, a lot of times we see, you know, that the ice caps are melting because the temperature is changing. We see that the polar bears are affected. We see cute animals that are at risk of extinction or losing their habitat. But actually humans, our neighbors, our family, um, our you know, people across the, the globe in different continent, different parts of the world, we're all being affected right now by climate change. Because actually, when the atmosphere becomes warmer, it holds a lot more water vapor. And when that happens over the ocean, for example, there's so much water that keeps evaporating and staying in the atmosphere and what happens when it gets really, really saturated and really humid, it's gonna dump down uh, on the ground again. So this is how you see a lot of um, intense big storms like hurricanes that developed and then hit um, the, the ground where you know it caused a lot of heavy downfall and rain and flooding. It's very dangerous. It kills people, it destroyed homes and community. And Actually, in Vietnam right now, there's massive flood and uh, landslide that are happening because of historic floods. Um, people have never seen this level of water before. 
Um, and oh, I think about over 100 people have died um, and tens of thousands of people are displaced. But, you know, we have finite amount of water on Earth. So when it's over, it's being moved to one particular area, all of that moisture is being taken up from somewhere else, right? That's actually where other parts of the world not experiencing drought or flooding, they are probably going through terrible droughts um, because of the way the atmosphere is moving um, the moisture around. So when you have farmers who are trying to grow crops or to raise their cattle, they're not able to do this. Wildlife animals are also endangered because their habitat is being affected. And then also in other parts of, of the world where we live in, you've heard about the recent uh, California fires that are still raging right now actually. And it gets worse and worse every year. And this year in particular, um, we um, the amount of damages uh, that has been done um, is very significant. And we still don't have the answer for that other than that, you know, we have to address the bigger, the bigger issue. Um, so what can we do about it? How do we address this issue? Uh, I would try to categorize our actions into three categories. So first, you try to prevent the problem from actually happening. And if you're not able to just prevent the problem is already here, then you try to mitigate or to sort of lessen, um, you know, the, the kind of contributions that are adding to the problem. And then in concurrently, what you can do is you can try to live with it because, you know, there's, it's, we've had a long time to take actions, but now to prevent climate change. And then when we get to a certain point, we can't slow it down anymore, but we can do something so that the future generation, you guys and your children and your grandchildren will have a better or even a, a still intact um, earth to, to live with. So we are doing some things uh, and, and I want to talk about what you're doing at home, uh, in the community, in, in our country and around the world. Uh, can anyone guess what's on the what's in this picture right here? Do we have some answers? This is like green stuff that's like flowing in a tube. What could it let's possibly give it, let's be? Let's give it a minute here um, for our for our viewers. Um, if you could take a closer look at the at the green um, item that's in the in the image. Uh, tell us what you see. What do you think you see? Um, someone says algae. Someone yeah. said uh, photosynthesis tubes. Very interesting. I like oh that. my goodness. And we have like some really sharp people like on top of things. Um, so yeah, you're exactly right. These are algae being grown in a tube. And why does this matter? Um, it's because algae are actually, turns out, are actually very good at photosynthesizing, taking sunlight and carbon dioxide, and then turn it into uh, oxygen, but also they, when they die and decompose, that becomes a type of uh, biomass that you can use to um, fertilize or uh, co compost into soil or uh, feed animals. So it's, it's hugely um, uh, beneficial. And this is just some, an example of something that's being uh, researched and developed uh, around the world in order to find a solution to combat climate change. But I'm sure if you look around your home, you look around your community, we see a lot more of these type of examples. Uh, you, if you live in New York City or you live um, anywhere, we uh, see a bus, or you, you can walk or you can bike around your community um, if everything is a little bit smaller and closer together or uh, public transportation is easily accessible. Uh, you can go shop at a farmer's market or buy in the grocery store, the locally produced products because they come from nearby, uh, they're, made, they're produced by farmers 
um, that are not uh, far away. So these are type of ex um, examples that were being given a lot, right? It's like, what can you do um, small scale at home in your personal life to help uh, alleviate the impact of climate change? If you live in a more uh, like suburb, suburban or like dispersed area, big areas you have to get around somehow. And uh, what kind of car is this? It's, it looks kind of strange. Uh, does, okay, it's an electric car and they're becoming more and more popular now compared to a few years ago when we mostly see gasoline or, um, or diesel car uh, run by fossil fuel that produce a lot of carbon emission. But now we can have electric car that um, do not produce this type of emission. But the additional step is that if you can also uh, make the energy that we consume to produce electricity greener by using renewable energy, then that's how you complete the cycle. And you can truly um, make our transportation, which is um, one of the biggest carbon emitters, um, more green. But there are way many, many more steps along the way, right? The food that we eat don't always come from local. Sometimes they're being produced around the world because that's where, that's the climate that they grow best in and that the farmers can produce a much uh, more, a larger quantity and then ship them to us. And so how do we make sure that the farm farming practice is sustainable, that it helps the farmer locally make their income and feed their family, but also help them feed us as well, right? And then when we get the food to the market, can we cut down on plastics? Can we cut down on excessive um, packaging? And then the products that we use in our everyday life, our clothes or books or pens and, uh, and, and toys, can we make sure that we don't buy more, we consume more than what we need because to produce them, to make them, um, it, can, it takes energy and it takes resources. And when we are finished with something, can we recycle? Can we donate it? Um, then and and keep you know the items from ending up in landfill and and um, the ocean. And then how can we teach people about conservation, about protecting the forests, about the natural resources, um, and support the local people who actually do live um, in in these areas um, to to help support them, but also to sort of uh, keep, um, yeah, keep the burdens off of, of these people who actually have to live um, near these areas that are being uh, destroyed. So I, let's see what we have left. So I wanna go quickly through some more examples and then we're going to break into um, a little uh, group so you can start thinking about your ideas. But around uh, New York City, especially, and other uh, air cities that are near where the water, uh, when you have sea level rise, there's going to be, um, and then this, you combine that with big storms, there's going to be surge of water inland um, that cause flooding and other damages. But if you can restore the, the environment to what it was before, um, you can kind of buffer, create like a type of buffer to <coughs> absorb some of this water. So this is an example of um, wetlands that are being restored around um, New York in order to help lessen the damage of big storms like Hurricane Sandy, you, you may remember. And another example is in Indonesia where they're actually they are in the middle of the ocean. Uh, you can see from the little uh, globe, it's a, uh, it's very hard to, you know, actually keep the flood water from coming in and, and potentially wiping out the entire city. So what does the government do? They're going to move the entire city into a higher location uh, that's more inland and that will help protect their, the city inhabitants and all of their resources. And this is just an example of some, someone has the crazy idea of building this massive tall tower that's actually not just a tower that you can live and work um, in, but also it helps purify the atmosphere. 
Uh, and I don't know how realistic this is right now or how, how quickly we can build a bunch of this type of buildings, but that's an idea and that's an, a vision that someone has for the future. So if we can actually make all of these ideas and all of these actions, and put it together to create a city that is sustainable, sustainable and, and livable, then we can protect our cute animals <laughs> that are actually not just there because they're cute, but because they are part of, um, of the environment and they're part of the earth and they contribute to, um, to you know, our, our everyday lives. So now I want to know what you will be thinking about or what do you envision uh, for what the future would look like. Uh, I think now I'm going to ask Cassie to start the poll. Um, the first question that I have for all of you uh, is that what do you think your, this, which image would resemble where you live the most? Uh, and actually, sorry, uh, can we actually stop this one second? So I need to advance to the next slide. Oops. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So you can see four images that I've uh, provided as the template. Uh, so I know that you you can choose, you don't have to use all four of them. You can choose whichever one you want to start with or maybe all of them. But I want to know which of these image actually rep, like is closely related to the environment that you live in. Like when you look around, when you drive around with your parents, what does your city look like? All right, so I'm seeing uh, three and four the most, and then some of two. Danny, can you help us describe what each of these might be? Yeah, I will. So the first one uh, is very sparse where you don't see a lot of other people. You don't see a lot of built structure. You see mostly natural landscape. Uh, you might, it might be very flat or it might be very forested or it might be very hilly um, and, and, and on top of a mountain or on top of like a mountain or uh, just in the middle of the field. And then when you, um, or maybe you live in an, a, a community that is a little bit dispersed, like you can see your neighbor's house a little bit down the street. Uh, and if you drive a little bit, you get to the store, you get to to your school, you get to the, the restaurants where you like to eat. And then um, you might live in New York City um, as number three would represent. Uh, a lot of, it's like everything is very close together. You can mostly walk outside and go get your, uh, get your food from, from a grocery store. You can walk to school or take the bus to school. Um, and, and you can take a bike ride um, to get downtown, for example. And then number four is where you see a lot of factories and a lot of um, probably uh, power, power plants uh, where, you're, where energy is being produced. Either um, you may see some solar panels or some wind turbines, or you may see um, a fossil fuel based uh, coal power plant. Okay, so I see that three and four, um, New York City and number four, um, actually now we have a tie between th and two and four. So I would say that um, it's more of a suburb. Two would be resemble a suburb and four would resemble an area where, you know, there's more industrial um, and, and not, and you still have to drive around to get to places. Okay, we can end this poll now. And then we get to the next question. Great, and then can we get to, now I want to, that was the previous question was what environment you live in, right? Now this question is, I wanna know what do you want the city, the future city where everybody can live um, that is in a world that is post climate change where it's, it's greener, it's better, it's, um, it's, it's sustainable, it's safe, it's um, healthy for everybody. What do you think the city would look like? Any 
And it doesn't have to look exactly like this. It would just be sort of like the base of what the city would look like. And then you can add your ideas to make it better. Okay, we'll give people a few more minutes to vote. I think we're okay. We've got about 73% of, of our respondents. So okay. It's pretty awesome. easily spread yeah. between one, two, and three. Yeah. So I, yeah, so we can end this poll now. And it's it seems like it's a split. I think everyone have different ideas. Um, actually, number two uh, would seem to be what people like to see is that it's a mix of being able to have a community, but also being able to have access to a lot of um, nice nature and, and clean air and, and nice forests and trees that we can enjoy, right? Okay. So now you can actually start drawing on your own. Um, usually I, I was hoping to get uh, breakout rooms and then have everyone talk um, amongst themselves to see what ideas they have. But maybe now we can just start sharing. Uh, if, if you uh, think, if you have the, pet, the paper in front of you um, and you're thinking of drawing something, uh, I hope that you maybe have an idea that you can want to share with everyone before you start drawing. After um, some of the examples that I've given, maybe you like something that you can, that you want to adopt into your own drawing. You can type it out or you can raise your hand and maybe Cassie can can um, let you talk. Yeah, so I think what would be best is even if you don't have um, the template or even if you don't have um, it downloaded or, or, you know, take a look at the, the empty or the blank templates that we shared via the chat box. Um, and let's type in your suggestions in either the chat box, you can use the Q&A box, whichever box you'd like. Um, and let's talk through and, and some of those, what those options might be. So um, Danny, maybe I think what would be helpful is if you could go through each of these, some of the sketches here. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you have bigger versions of these, um, but to perhaps describe um, things that people can add and ideas that people can add to their drawings of what they think of their future city might or, sh or, or what, what they want their future cities to look like. Okay, yeah, so I can go through some of these examples. I can't really move my mouse around, um, but Let's see, I'll pick the green, you can see the green hill that is sort of in the middle with the big sun. So this person had the idea that there would be a lot of tur wind turbines and, um, and, and solar panels that we can then use to harness um, natural resources like wind and sunlight, which is readily available and use that to uh, fuel our, our, our lives in a very clean way. Um, and then uh, the house would be covered with a lot of um, plants. And also we help, we reforest and we, you know, plant more trees to help um, absorb the carbon dioxide. And this will also help will remove some of that greenhouse gas that we have um, in excess. And then the person next to, uh, the person that, that drew, drew the city um, next to the Green Hill, uh, they have the idea that there would be um, a big green park along the waterfront. Uh, um, and this will be sort of have multi-purpose. They would have a bike path, they would have um, uh, and uh, a berm that helps absorb the water and block some of these flood water from coming in and destroying um, the, the city. Um, but also this is a recreational area. It's kind of like a park and a nice area that people can visit and spend time to um, study or learn about um, the ecology. And then within the city, uh, every rooftop is green. Um, which means it has plant growing or it has some sort of like um, uh, light, uh, sunlight um, absorbent energy um, 
technology so that um, it can reduce heating and cooling um, demand, uh, which also means that it's going to decrease the amount of carbon emission um, with it for for the um, uh, within the city. And uh, yeah, and then the person on the uh, far above the what, there's a, a figure that has like a red building. Um, this person thinks that there would be, you know, technology to capture, um, not only reduce carbon in our, in our um, everyday life activities, but also to capture, recapture a lot of the emission that's already been produced. Um, but what they also think is necessary is that we need to have policies. So changes with, within our policies from our city, from our state, from our uh, federal government that will help promote um, an increase in um, renewable energy and cut down on the carbon intensive um, forms of, of energy and to um, help us um, you know, address the bigger issue of climate change as a country. Um, and this may involve getting um, become a part again of the um, Paris Climate uh, Accord, which helps um, all the countries set a goal to reduce their carbon emission and then actually strive towards meeting that goal together as the world, um, because one country cannot uh, do anything to make enough impact um, to, to make a change. But if we can all act together, then that um, that is a lot more impactful. So yeah, I hope that that gives you um, some ideas. And I know there's uh, we're a little bit low on time, so I can't see what you're drawing, or you won't have enough time to finish this. But please take more time to think about this and finish your drawing. Uh, and uh, Cassie can tell you. Um, maybe you can email me or or Cassie with your final products um, with some description. Uh, so we know what you what you meant and that way we can sort of create um, a little collage or a little album just like I have here uh, and then we can share it because we need more ideas uh, that is how we innovate and that is how we move towards the future great so yeah I think um, if, just so everyone knows the eight images that you see here were submitted by other uh, individuals who had previously done this and done the templates if you don't want to use uh, one of these templates feel free to draw your own you know the environments that we described might not have been exactly where you live and that's okay so sh please share with us um, if you have ideas and, and sketches um, we do have one comment here um, and in terms of suggestions for what it is we can do um, so transitioning from coal-fired uh, power plants to more sustainable energy resources such as wind and solar in uh, my location would be desirable. Absolutely. Um, I think a lot of these um, renewable or more sustainable energy sources, uh, when they were first introduced, were super expensive and totally inaccessible, um, especially for, for small homes. But now, you know, I'll take a drive, um, maybe not in New York City, but just very uh, shortly, or you don't have to go very far to see solar panels on someone's roof. Um, and, um, and it's a lot, um, it, it's a lot more accessible, there's a lot more alternatives. Um, another thing that I have seen, um, you know, as I'm talking, feel free to think through other, other things that you have either personally tried to do, um, or to improve your city, um, you know, for example, biking became a really, uh, biking was something that Danny had mentioned. Um, in New York City, there's city bike and there's bike sharing programs all over the country, all over the world. And that's one way to reduce um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air because when you're biking, um, you're not driving a vehicle and you are, um, you are uh, the, the bike itself is not contributing to, to CO2 emissions. Um, um, and making, but making sure that those uh, those biking programs are actually available is an important part of policy making for a city. So again, in New York City, the example is is city bike um, and making that available in di all different neighborhoods and not just you know in one of the boroughs, but trying to expand it out to all five boroughs. Um, I promise this presentation is not brought to you by city bike. Um, <laughs> 
So that's one way and bike paths. Um, and uh, so that's one very popular way um, to make a city more green. I've definitely also seen sort of plans and, and suggestions for essentially, um, you know, there's a lot of this work that goes on at another Earth Institute Center, the um, I can't remember the exact, uh, the acronym, what it stands for. I think it's Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes. And so there uh, it's, it's architecture, thinking about city planning um, and how we would actually rebuild lower Manhattan, for example, um, to, so, so that it's less susceptible to, to flooding. Um, planting more trees, though that's another example. So before I give away all the answers and, and, uh, and take over this thing completely, um, think, about, think about other ways you've heard or seen. Um, maybe you've seen changes. I, so I used to live in uh, lower Manhattan on uh, Wall Street. And when Sandy hit um, the, our building, the basement totally flooded, the building was deemed uninhabitable. Um, and since then, I've seen a lot of changes to the area, because um, we're not far from either the Hudson and where the East River meet. Um, and since then, I've seen a lot of changes to that space. Um, and, and things are being rebuilt and, and updated. So um, things are happening. Um, so we, have, we do have a question. Um, why are non-renewable resources uh, more prominent than renewable resources, which are more sustainable and accessible? That's a good question. Danny, do you, any, any suggestions? I don't want to take over your session. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is the question again? Why oh, are- Do you see it in the, um, can you open up the Q&A box or can you not see it? Uh, so, sorry, I have to exit the screen <laughs> to go yeah, back yeah. to the Q&A. So, why are non-renewable resources ah. more prominent mm -hmm. than renewable resources which are more sustainable and accessible? Okay, so when we, when the industrial revolution first happened, it happens because we discovered that we can burn coal and produce energy. And then when, you know, over, over time, technology developed and then we learn of new ways um, to create energy, such as developing these PV solar panels that can capture sunlight and turn that into energy or create these wind turbines. Actually, wind turbine is like a technology that have existed for a very long time. Uh, but the big turbines uh, that you can see when you drive through a desert um, or, or like in some parts of the country, it, those took a long time um, for us to be able to build at that scale because that's when you can actually generate enough energy. And so, and then when you, once you have the energy, you also need the technology to actually store it um, because when you burn coal, it immediately feeds it into um, the, the power grid and then it gets distributed to your homes and then you're able to use it. But with, with um, uh, solar panels and, and wind turbines, the, the problem is they're not constantly producing, right? Because we're not, um, we don't see sunlight in a location 24 hours a day. And the wind, sometimes it comes a lot. Sometimes it's, it's not windy at all. And so the, you know, when sometimes the demand, like in the middle of the day, when everyone is like doing uh, their daily activities, you need a lot of power, but, um, but you may not have the power produced um, by wind and, and solar in order to meet that demand. So what we need is to store that energy when we can produce a lot and then use it later. And the technology to store and then use the energy later um, is something that we you know, took a long time to develop. Um, and in the meantime, you know, it's easy for us to continue doing what we used to do. Um, changes are scary um, and costly because when you have to switch from one thing to another, it takes some kind of in initial investment. Um, and that's, that's why it took us so long um, to actually, you know, create these changes. But once you get the momentum going, once you get things started, and now, as Cassie has mentioned, um, solar panels are a lot cheaper and more accessible. Uh, you know, electric vehicles are a lot more common now. You can drive down the road and you can probably see a hybrid car or a fully electric car, uh, a lot more common than I would have seen um, when I was growing up. 
uh, maybe just even 10 years ago, I wouldn't, I, we wouldn't have seen uh, electric cars as often as we do today. And so just, you know, over time, I think people understand and learn more about climate change and they uh, understand that what, what, what changes need to happen. Um, and then, you know, make the effort and make the policy to actually allow these changes to happen. And uh, something fun that I just remember when Cassie mentioned biking is that uh, I think in Amsterdam, they just introduced this program where if you bike um, and you use the city bike, um, all of the energy that you generated because you're you're turning this, these wheels with, with your legs and uh, right? So you're putting a lot of power into it that power is captured and stored in the bike. And then when you dock the bike after you've done uh, riding it, it actually feed that energy back into a battery. And then that actually helps like uh, light up the, the, the street lamps or, you know, use it for other, other um, activities that needs energy. So it's really cool that like, even just with biking, you can produce energy that is entirely green that doesn't have any emission. Uh, and then in Iceland and Greenland, you know, solar and wind are just two type of a lot of different um, renewable sources that we have out there. Uh, uh, I haven't mentioned uh, geothermal, but that's actually also uh, very widely, um, very common. Um, so areas, some areas, um, some cities is located in places where you have a lot of heat um, in the ground the because of because of um, ge their ge geologic formation and so if you're able to harness that heat uh, and they I think this is done by uh, putting uh, water deep into the ground where it gets heat up and then the steam would then come up to the ground and the steam is used to turn a turbine and this also produce energy and so uh, Iceland and Greenland would use this to heat the road um, all of the roads in the country during the winter so that, um, you know, so if the snow heavily or if it's like gets very cold and the, the road freeze over, this um, geothermal energy would help keep the roads warm. And it helps, uh, you know, drivers get around more easily uh, without accidents. And it's also provided by the earth. You don't have to uh, produce any um, emissions. Uh, so to, to, to make this happen. So there's a lot of technology and ideas that exist, but also, you know, you're not a scientist yet, but if you just think of an idea, believe me, technology, and there will be researchers and engineers who can make this happen. Uh, Cause you know, a lot of times things that we never imagined before, um, you know, it comes into existence and it's, um, develop very quickly um, within 10 or 20 years. Because if you have this, or if your parents have a smartphone, 20 years ago, these didn't exist, you know, and now everybody has one. So I would say that's a, and it's like basically an equivalent of a computer that fits within your hand. So, you know, just think about how that's able to happen. Uh, and, and you think of it, that in terms of um, climate solutions. Great, thanks, Danny. I think that's a really great reminder. Um, the things do take some time, um, but you know we, uh, we certainly have a lot more knowledge about climate change and uh, mitigation uh, strategies and ideas for what we can do um, to help us um, become more resilient um, with climate change. Um, so we're just, out of time. Um, so I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We just had a question about whether or not the session would be made available. Absolutely. It will be available on the same website. I just put it into the chat box. It will be available in the, on the same site as uh, the templates for download. And as I said, if you don't, uh, if you'd like to use your own template, feel free to sketch one out. We'd love to see what you might put into your future ideal city and what you envision it to, to be based on the, the ideas uh, you heard here. Um, Danny, any last uh, sort of final pieces of advice as, as people might go off and, and uh, imagine their own future cities? 
Well, I want to thank you so much for joining the session and having maybe some of you have joined um, the other open house session too. And I think we're all very excited to have you join this one, but also we really look forward to welcome you back to Lamont um, at some time. Uh, hopefully by next year, if not the year or the year after. Um, but please, please, please uh, do send us what you come up with. I really would love to see it. Think of yourself as architects uh, of the future, uh, because I think, you know, we, we, we don't, you don't have to be trained to be an architect. An architect is just someone who pay attention, who learn about what needs, um, what people need, um, you know, what, what, what are the solutions and to brainstorm and to make, you know, create like some kind of vision that can then, um, you know, become reality someday. So thank you again for joining. Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, for our viewers, if you have any additional questions, feel free to email me directly. Um, we will have uh, all the, all the sessions have been recorded. So you can definitely feel free to check them out. Um, and Danny, thank you so much again for your time. And everyone, I hope you have a great afternoon. Yeah, right. Actually, we have one more question. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Answer? Yeah, so, wanna... yeah, the question is that uh, if I think the, if we think the increased usage of biogas promotes sustainable living, uh, I would say it depends on how the biogas is produced. If it's something that's naturally occurring and then you capture that and you make use of it, that's a really good way to, you know, not let something go to waste, right? Um, but if you have to input a lot of energy and a lot of resources in order to get the biogas, then that's probably not sustainable. Uh, so it really depends on how this is done. Um, but it definitely, if, if it's natural, if it's something that's already a byproduct, which means it was already being produced anyway um, for some other reason, and you can capture that to use it, um, that that's uh, very efficient. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again. And thank you, Cassie, for <laughs> facilitating. Not a problem. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Bye.